Tressa, are we off to the races? We are. Welcome. We are off to the races. Hello, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Caroline Randall Williams, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And by way of visual description, which is an accessibility practice widely adopted in virtual meetings, I am a uh, a woman of mixed uh, African and European descent from the United States with curly hair and brown eyes. And I serve on the board of uh, directors of Folk Alliance International and on their behalf and that of the staff. I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's Cultural Equity Town Hall. Before we begin, let's take a moment to note that we are joined today by folks from around the globe and to collectively recognize the importance, complexity, and difficulty of offering land acknowledgements in the context of online organizing, creation, and collaboration. I am typically based in Nashville, Tennessee, the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary land of the Shawnee, the Yuchi, and the Eastern Cherokee people, among many other indigenous nations who have lived on and in relation with this land. And I'm currently joining you from Santa Fe, New Mexico, the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary land of the Pueblo people. We invite you to not only join in acknowledging our shared responsibility to work toward reconciliation, but to commit to taking personal, meaningful, and measurable action toward healing the legacies of colonization, forced migration, and cultural erasure. You're welcome to share a land acknowledgement in the chat as you introduce yourself. And if you need a resource to assist you, we invite you to visit native-land.ca. Um, and there'll be a link dropped in the chat shortly um, if you would like to explore that resource further. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that FAI's office is on the traditional territory of the Kansas, Ka, Osage, and Ojetishik, oh my gosh, Ojetishikoan nations. We honor their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'd now like to welcome the council's two co-conveners, Karima Dowdy and Dom Flemons. Hi, aloha, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Karima Dowdy. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am calling in today from Honolulu, Hawaii, which is the occupied kingdom of Hawaii, uh, the land of the Kanaka Maoli people. Um, and, but originally from Chicago, um, the land of Potawatomi, Ocheti, Shakoin, Peoria, Miami, and many other groups um, from where I was born and raised. So just wanted to give a little bit of context for this meeting and why we're all here today. Um, I am one of the co-conveners of the Cultural Equity Council along with Don Flemons. And um, it's been about a little bit over a year now that we've been working on this council um, very closely with the FAI board and um, leadership. And Folk Alliance International has actually had an eight year focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, training, awareness, and programming. And this is all sort of taking us to the next level. So in 2020, Folk Alliance International actually um, held a cultural equity summit during the conference um, that was hosted by the Association of Cultural Equity and Women of Color. Um, at that time, Folk Alliance International also presented a draft cultural equity statement. Um, and that's been sort of the timeline thus far. So finally, um, at that time, Folk Alliance International also announced plans for an arm length council to advise Folk Alliance, um, which is what, which is the council that has brought everybody together today. So what exactly does that mean an arm's length council? Well, it's not run by board or staff. Um, it is supported by it, however. And it's meant to really make independent decisions and recommendations by sort of being the ears to the ground, the folks who are in community, who are listening to the conversations that are being had um, throughout our diverse uh, folk community and sort of bringing that back and um, synthesizing the things that we've learned and making recommendations to the Folk Alliance Board to continue this work and to really make it a grassroots effort. So we're kind of out there, um, you know, uh, collecting everything that we hear, making bridges between um, the executive 
direction of Folk Alliance and, folk, and folks who are just members or part of the community at large who have maybe not had a chance to have this direct line to um, leadership in the past. So Dom and I were invited to be co-conveners about a year ago, along with um, the Folk Alliance International's board and staff. We actually undertook a year long training to start off with. So we all were grounded from the same place, same language, use same um, kind of viewpoints. And that was a, um, a BIPOC owned organization company called Team Dynamics. And they reviewed Folk Alliance International structure and relationship to equity learning and issues. So we all went through that together before even embarking on this, um, this council. So after that, after lots of discussion, we assembled a representative group as the Cultural Equity Council, many of whom are on the call today and you will meet in just a little bit. The charge of this council is to really listen and ultimately make recommendations that will inform the next strategic plan of the board, which is being developed in May. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. And so far our activities have included sharing together as a council, observing Folk Alliance's affinity groups, receiving community testimonials, which you will hear shortly, hosting this town hall. Um, we'll also be reflecting on everything we've learned as a council and delivering a report with recommendations to the board. And then a summary will be provided by the council at the conference in May. So we look forward to sharing and also most importantly, listening today and with that, I would like to hand it over to my co-convener, Dom Flemons. Thank you so much, Karima. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. My name is Dom Flemons. I'm known as the American Songster. I'm a songwriter, artist, musician, producer, a record collector, and a radio personality, and advocate for folk music. And for many years, being a part of Folk Alliance, um, I've I first came to the conference in 2007 as a part of the Carolina Chocolate Drops, and I've continued to attend the conference in a lot of different capacities since then. And I also served on the board several years back, and I was uh, the first African-American uh, board member to Folk Alliance International. And so over time, uh, the board and Folk Alliance International as an organization, they've, they've taken a lot of efforts to uh, broaden the reach of where Folk Alliance can go and how it can receive information. Because one of the biggest things that has come up uh, has, has been the feeling that people are not being heard in one form or another. And so the Cultural Equity Council began, um, actually uh, Angus and I had a conversation very early on and I recommended that he look at an article that was published by Alan Lomax uh, it's called An Appeal for Cultural Equity, and we are now celebrating the 50th anniversary of this uh, groundbreaking article this year in, in 2022. And uh, to summarize, uh, after his life of working in folk music, Alan Lomax wanted to see that each individual community, whoever they might be, would, that they could have time on the stage, on the air, and in the classroom. And now, that we have seen a full digital age come upon us as folk music advocates, we now have to find other ways to continue the same work, being able to bring marginalized communities onto the stage, onto the air and in the classroom, wherever that may be, and that's through educational programming. So it's amazing to see this Cultural Equity Council come together with a little bit of that spirit in its background, but of course, with uh, an appeal for cultural equity being 50 years old, the scholarship and the notions behind that article are so outdated. We are trying to do something that is forward facing and moving into the 21st century. And so with that being said, I'd like to share a little bit of the format for today's town, town hall. So we're gonna be starting by taking a moment to have each of the Cultural Equity Council members introduce themselves. And we're gonna do this by uh, using first names in alphabetical order so that they can each talk about their name and their role and they can spend a little time uh, discussing the way that they identify themselves. And so we're gonna be hearing from a few of the community members who have submitted testimonials for the council. And then following that, our council members will share their observations from the recent online affin affinity groups that they all attended. 
And uh, while we don't have closed captioning in place for today's meeting, it's being recorded and a full transcript will be made available after the meeting and will be posted on FAI's website. So let's get started with our introductions with Alka Sharma, who will start us off. And then I will ask each council member in alphabetical order to introduce themselves and their community role and relationship to this council work. So let's start off with Alka. So I'll pass that off to you, Alka. Thanks, Dom. Thanks, Karima. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm, I work and live on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabek peoples, which is also known as Ottawa in Canada. And I'm the former executive director of Folk Music Ontario, which is also the office is based in Ottawa. And uh, now I work for the federal government here in uh, Canada. And I de identify myself as a South Asian Canadian. My parents are immigrants from India in uh, the mid 60s. Uh, I guess I'm first generation Canadian, as they say, um, and that's uh, as as a woman of color is how I identify. And I'm happy to be here. And this has come to fruition uh, with Folk Alliance. I'm also on the board of Folk Alliance. I'm just ended my tenure as treasurer, and I have one more year to go as being on the board. And uh, it's been a long time coming. So this is really great to see all these amazing faces and uh, all the things that are going to happen with the Cultural Equity Council. Thank you. All right. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Is, is there is the listing already there? Sorry, I just want to make sure. Oh, no, Dom, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But... Well, you happen to be the next on the list, Caroline. So I... It's... I, I just didn't want to mess up the flow of you introducing people down the, I, I jumped the gun and uh, just a little bit, sorry. Hi everyone, uh, it's me again, Caroline Randall-Williams here. Um, I am a professor at Vanderbilt University. I study sort of alternative texts. I'm a poet, um, a journalist, social commentator, um, and occasional co-writer of, uh, uh, a co-writer of with people who can actually sing and play instruments. And, and I, teach, I teach blues lyric as literature at Vanderbilt, um, which I find to be uh, you know, one, of the, one of the great folk traditions of this country. Um, and I am a, uh, a woman of color like Alka in, and, I, and I inhabit uh, the Southeastern United States. And that very much informs my, perspective, my worldview and perspective on all of this conversation. Um, and I uh, am terribly grateful to get to be on the board of directors of the Folk Alliance International and to have been invited to uh, join the people on the Cultural Equity Council who are thinking about um, how we invite uh, this organization that we love and serve to um, expand its sense of inclusivity and of um, representation and of honoring all of the many truths that we must hold together at once. And uh, I observed the folks from the African diaspora affinity group, which was terrifically inspiring, although I was utterly useless during it because I was very sick with COVID and laying in the dark while listening to everyone speak. But it actually uplifted me and nourished me and I think it helped me recover faster. So <laughs> that's all that is, what the work we're doing here is healing and I am grateful to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Wonderful. Well, let's uh, move next to Charlie. Uh, thanks, Tom. I'm Charlie Mossbrook. I am uh, the president of Folk Alliance Region Midwest. I live in Cleveland, Ohio, which is uh, the lands where the Maumee or the Delaware and the Wyandotte and uh, probably the Algonquin uh, inhabited here. Uh, I am living with a spinal cord injury, uh, so I identify as disabled. And with that, I'm going to give you my uh, what I look like and what, where I'm sitting. Uh, for those who can't see, I am sitting in a fairly small room with some uh, tokens of my folk music uh, life behind me. I have very short hair. I am a, a middle-aged white man. I'm wearing a Folk Alliance shirt from Montreal and a Cavs jacket. And I don't think I have much else to say. I want to 
meet the other folks. Oh, I am a he and a him. Thank you so much, Charlie. Let's move on to Alexa. Bojo Jayak, Alexa Dawson, Amon Dejakas, Bobe Watami Anishinaabe Kwayandao. I do identify as a Potawatomi national, although a diasporic one here in Kansas, um, away from our homelands in the um, in the Great Lakes region in what's now known as Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, here in the Flint Hills, I live on uh, territory that rightfully belongs to the Osage and Kanza people. And the beautiful tall grass prairie, and that um, informs a lot of my work. I am a musician, an educator, a land-based and music educator. I um, have two daughters and I have a couple of bands and projects that um, are labors of love and then a solo career as well. I am on the staff this year for Folk Alliance as the outreach coordinator and I have been having an absolute ball doing that. Um, the Cultural Equity Council has been a really a great opportunity for me to see Folk Alliance do a little bit more of a critical lens because I am just, as Aka said, and as others have said, just in love with this organization and um, pretty new to it. My first Folk Alliance was in New Orleans. And so I'm just kind of now getting pulled in and um, really enjoying my time with all of you and grateful to have been included to have um, my voice heard, but also to be able to represent uh, people like me who are Potawatomi or rural or grew up in poverty or are, you know, been presenting or, or any of those things. So I am thankful to Folk Alliance for listening and uh, for opening an ear. So I think that's all I have to say. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Alexa. Well, let's uh, uh, have Gerald speak next. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm Gerald Torres. I'm um, uh, I was a faculty at, at, at Yale the Law School of the Yale School of Environment. Um, I'm a, uh, a poet and a musician uh, uh, and, you know, writer. That's <laughs> what, what I do. Anyway, I'm glad to be here. I was uh, in the Indigenous uh, uh, Affinity Group. Um, my mother's side of my family is uh, all indigenous from uh, Lagos de Moreno in uh, Jalisco State. I'm also uh, Chicano, so I identify in those two groups. Um, uh, I look forward to us having a productive conversation. Um, thank you. Um, I'm in Connecticut on the uh, ancestral lands of the, the Pequot, where I sit at this moment. Great, thank you so much, Gerald. Um, we'll have uh, Jacqueline and Jackie. Uh, uh, maybe you can speak next. We have Jacqueline in. I need to unmute. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I'm glad you're here. Um, Jacqueline Marushka. Um, dad is a uh, Hungarian Danish. Um, mom is a uh, native northern New Mexican, and I grew up in northern New Mexico amongst the eight northern Pueblos and um, a beautiful mix of um, uh, Mexican um, and, and French and black and white and, and eight tribes. Um, and and I, I'm grateful for what Folk Alliance is doing here because until now I never felt that sort of aggregated love as as uh, as I, what I grew up with. So um, I'm I'm grateful to be part and represent um, more of the Latina experience. Um, and just thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Jackie. And uh, we'll have Janice next. Hello, everyone. Anyaseo. 
My name is Janice Jolie. My Korean name is Yi Sing Hye. I'm coming to you from Takaranto in the colonial lands of Ontario, Canada. I'm a member of the Cultural Equity Committee and I've also been a facilitator of the Committing to Conversation series. I am a singer songwriter, a spoken word poet, an actor, playwright, and clown. And I'm interested in building relationship through folk music. And it makes a lot of sense for me um, that the folk community is interested in equity. And to me, it's about, like we can talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but truly to me, it's about love and friendship. Like if I want to love the people in my community, I want to not oppress them. And to not oppress them, sometimes I need to educate myself and have difficult conversations and build trust and build relationships. So I love the language around committing to these conversations because we're not going to solve equity in the next strategic plan or in the next 10 years. We're going to work on it for the rest of our lives. And, and I think that's how we build beautiful, vibrant uh, folk music communities where people feel like they belong. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janice. Let's have uh, Justin next. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Hiltner. I'm a banjo player, a singer songwriter, and a journalist and an activist. Um, I approach this work, equity work, justice work, from the perspectives of my queerness and my disability. Um, I uh, am a recent cancer survivor, so I sat in on the affinity group for cancer survivors and folks with chronic illnesses, um, which is um, it's, it's a community, it's a kind of a group of folks that often feels marginalized by the hustle of the music industry. Um, and I also approach this work from the perspective of having limited economic mobility due to systemic homophobia. I'm a banjo player and there aren't gigs for gay banjo players. Um, I'm really humbled and honored to be um, on this panel with these folks, many of them who are heroes of mine. Um, and uh, I'm just looking forward to continuing this work with this, with this council. Um, oh, and my pronouns are he and they, either works. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, one council member will not be able to join us uh, on this meeting, that's Lily Lewis. So I wanna acknowledge her, but she will be with us during all of our strategic planning. But um, I'd like to then move on to Mercedes. Hello, everyone. And I apologize for the noise around me. I'm just at a cafe visiting family in DC. So that's why. But um, I'm currently on the traditional territory of the Muslim Squamish and Tulane Batuth, um, but originally um, from Toronto, living there. Um, I am what I consider second generation. Uh, Canadian. My parents came and landed as refugees back in the 80s. I was born in Canada. Um, I can I identify as uh, Latinx as well as Mestiza, which is half Indigenous and Latin is Mayan heritage descent. Um, and I'm just really excited to be part of this uh, cultural equity uh, council because I think there's so much important work to be done. I currently work with Small World Music in Toronto as well as Sunfest in London, Ontario. And, you know, we present, these are two organizations that have presented um, and worked with underrepresented artists for years and years and years before DEI was a thing to talk about. So, I'm really, really excited to be opening this floor now and continuing these conversations because, you know, especially with things such as like the study that just came out, came out from the Canadian Live Music Association, uh, which is called Closing the Gap. If you don't know it, please look it up. These are things that perhaps in this room are not surprising to any of us, but it is amazing to have them officially documented on a piece of paper that we can talk about and really use it whenever it is that we're going for cultural change and advocacy, especially within granting institutions. So happy to be here with you all. Uh, please contact me if you'd like. And my pronouns actually there. Thank you so much, Mercedes. And maybe we can get um, get the, that link in the chat at some point that you had, you had mentioned there so we can keep up there. Thank you for joining us. Let's uh, next go to Paula. Hi, everyone. I'm Paula Boggs uh, out of Seattle, Washington. So the land of the Duwamish and uh, Sammamish. Uh, my pronouns are uh, she, her, and I too am a member of the council. I um, 
I'm a uh, singer-songwriter and public speaker, recovered lawyer. Uh, and um, I was able to uh, observe the activism uh, affinity group and uh, found it to be well attended. Uh, there is tremendous diversity uh, within, or at least there was, among the participants in the range of uh, activism uh, members participate in. Uh, and I think, I find it very exciting to try to figure out how we harness that talent um, to uh, the benefit of, uh, of FAI and uh, its members. I'm really um, happy to be here. My, um, my family uh, has been on the land uh, that is now the United States uh, for uh, 10 generations, uh, starting in the late uh, 1700s as enslaved people on both sides of my family. And um, in terms of uh, identity, uh, I, I, I guess I, I'm a poster child uh, in some ways for intersectionality uh, as um, an African-American woman who is also a member of the LGBTQ IA uh, community and um, and those uh, those fusions often show up in my music. So uh, great to be with all of you. Happy to learn, and uh, I'll pass the baton to the next person, Dom. Thank you so much, Paula. Well, let's uh, get Reggie. Hello, all. Uh, I'm Reggie Harris. I am living in upstate New York, originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, my family started life on a plantation in Ashland, Virginia called Hickory Hill. And I am a descendant of an enslaved African-American woman, Bibhana Hewlett, uh, who had six children uh, by her master, Williams Carter Wickham, uh, a union that, uh, of course, was unequal in power, but it is what produced my family. And um, in 1992, having found that out, I was able to, in 2012, actually make connections with members of the Wickham family. And so a lot of what we are doing here in terms of searching for not only connection, but also equity, um, are conversations that I'm now having with that side of the family. I'm an educator, I'm a musician, a songwriter, a storyteller. Um, I'm also president of the Living Legacy Project, which is a organization that does uh, civil rights pilgrimages and education. And I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I attended the uh, BIPOC uh, uh, affinity group um, just for myself, but I also attended the uh, Folks 55 Plus, uh, which is also part of a community that I now find myself very happy to be part of. Uh, and that experience was uh, very nurturing, and uh, and I find this entire effort uh, to be something that is very timely and very powerful, and I'm happy to be part of it. Thank you so much, Reggie. Well, let's go to Susie next. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Susie Gann. And um, I uh, use she and they pronouns. Um, I am in Portland, Oregon currently, and uh, which rests on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, the Kathlamet, uh, the Clackamas, the Chinook, the Malala. Um, a lot of tribes were here because of the gorge and the river that went out. And it was a, a big meeting place. Um, I'm first generation here in the States. My parents are refugees from the, v the Vietnam War and they are currently living in Michigan. Um, and I liked how Janice 
shared her Korean name. So my Chinese name is Yi. Um, and I'm a FAI director, board director currently, and I just finished my term and I'm rotating off now. Six to seven years prior to that, I was also on the nominations committee that was uh, helping bring new board members onto um, the Folk Alliance Board of Directors. So I was very proud of that. My first Folk Alliance was in 2004. Um, and my first conference I ever went to in my career. Um, so I'm a booking agent over at Ground Control Touring. Uh, and recently last summer I actually started uh, putting on shows as well um, at an outdoor farm here in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I just, I find this work to be really important in terms of, you know, and, and to sort of talk about Paula's perspective of having different sort of viewpoints and intersectionality. That was really exciting. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to hear everybody's sort of understanding towards each other. And I was able to attend the uh, LGBTQ plus affinity group which was really fascinating and, and just really personal. And I hope everybody kind of had that experience with their affinity groups as well. Um, but it's nice to meet you all and I'm happy to be here. Wonderful, thank you so much, Susie. And then we will have one more, we'll have Umer. Uh, and that'll be the last one for the council this time around. And of course there's a, a Amy, but she'll speak a little bit later. Uh, thank you, Dom. Hello, everyone. My name is Omer Jafar. I am currently coming to you from Dubai in the UAE, uh, which is the land of the Emirati Arab people. And it's 2 a.m. here, so please apologies if you hear um, me yawn as I talk or see me on the screen. I'm the executive director of Small World Music, which is an organization that uh, operates from Takaranto or Toronto. And our mandate is to make space and serve uh, equity deserving artists and community members. Uh, and my teammate Mercedes also introduced herself. Um, so we are very excited to be doing the work uh, that we do here uh, from Canada and be part of this council. Uh, I am an immigrant from Pakistan and prior to immigrating to Canada, I've worked with traditional and folk music in uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan and India. Um, I was part of the international cohort, uh, international affinity group uh, for this council, uh, which was not very international, unfortunately. And uh, that is also good learning uh, to bring to the table and share with all of you here. And that's me, thank you. Thank you so much, Umair. And ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's uh, your cultural equity council. So these are, all of the wonderful people who have volunteered their time to bring us all together. And again, like uh, Karima mentioned before, this is a conduit so that our Folk Alliance International community can reach out to the council so that the council can, you know, translate the voices that, that you know, that, that sometimes Folk Alliance may, may see something or something may be overlooked, but the council's here to kind of be able to reach out take in the, the uh, observations of our community and be able to try to turn that into change that, is, uh, that will benefit everybody, I, I would hope, of course. And uh, this is just, it's just been amazing. I also would, um, uh, as we've been talking, all of the affinity groups, in case you may be new to the affinity groups or, or the sessions, we have all of the different demographics and all the different ways that the affinity groups have been broken up. So as we're, as you're observing um, and have, may have questions, please feel free to look at some of these different affinity groups if you have questions along those lines. So just something to keep in mind, but we're gonna move to the next part here. So once again, let's just give it up for our Cultural Equity Council, the digital hand claps, you know. You can hear mine, but I know I'm gonna hear yours and in, in my mind and everything we do, you know, wonderful. We got digital as well as literal hand claps. That's beautiful. And so we'll, we're gonna move on to the next tier, which is going to be our community submissions here. So as part of our listening process, we received a number of community testimonials through an open form, which we'll share again at the end of this meeting. 
and some were simply to be shared with the council, but others indicated that they were willing and interested to share their thoughts and experiences during this meeting. And I'd like to invite those speakers up now. And so we will start with Iona. Good evening, Abdi. I am Iona Fife. I am a Scots singer, a folk singer, coming to you from Glasgow via Aberdeenshire in Scotland. And I acknowledge the city and the country and the nation's part in imperialism and colonialism and of course its role in the slave trade. We are having conversations over here in Scotland about reparations. Um, I am a graduate of the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. I'm the first in my family to go to university. I grew up in a very rural area suffering from both poverty as well as rural deprivation. I have hypermobility syndrome and fibromyalgia and have a long-term chronic health illness and therefore I identify as being disabled and in some countries these um, these uh, health issues do not um, count as a disability yet so it really depends on, on where I am and, and but that's how I feel. So my pronouns are she, her and for those that um, have sight problems. I'm in a white room with some wallpaper that's brown and I'm wearing my jammies because it's half 11 at night here and my hair's a bit wet. I've got blonde hair, blue eyes. I'm, I'm very white. Um, I'm very passionate about um, collective movement. I am a board member of the Musicians Union in the UK and I'm a Scots speaker, which is a marginalised, oppressed language that does not have legal status in Scotland or the UK yet, despite having status in Europe. So um, I'm here to talk about um, an issue that is pervasive and has went through a sort of Me Too movement in Scotland and Ireland in the last year, and that is equality and sexual harassment in the folk and trad music industries. Now, I'm being very genre specific because as you'll hear, different genres, although suffering from the exact same issues, have um, avenues of help which is available to them. For example, I can't speak for a classical orchestra player because in Scotland, at least, um, there are several routes that a classical musician can go down if they are employed by an orchestra. They can go to HR, they can get their grievances dealt with um, almost officially. Um, but unfortunately, pop, punk, indie, folk, every other genre, really, if you are a victim of misogyny or sexism, you really don't know where and who to turn to. So I'm going to start speaking about the language because this is a microaggression that we face time and time again. And growing up, this is the first thing that I noticed. When I was 15, 16, going to folk clubs in Scotland, the way that I was being described was different from the way that other singers were being described. We were all singing unaccompanied ballads and folk songs, but I was being described for what I looked like, whereas the other singers were being described for the songs that they did or how good their storytelling was. Then when I started touring under my own name, employing several freelance musicians, some male, some female, I found that the the women identifying and the, and the women in my band and myself, we were commented on um, by promoters, by MCs, by presenters on our looks, whereas the men were being commented on their formidability as musicians. So first of all, we have to acknowledge that the language that we use, although we sometimes accidentally have internalized misogyny, the language is a huge, huge microaggression, which contributes to this per pervasive culture um, so yeah, we go on from language. As uh, a young musician, I went to several Fashion and Gale things, TMSA things. Basically, we've got organizations in Scotland which seeks to educate mu um, young musicians in folk music. A lot of the time, girls used to be tended towards going in for singing, for fiddle, for clarsach, for piano, things which are more feminine, instruments that are more feminine. I say that with, with quotes. Men were often put toward uh, things like guitar or bagpipes or bowden, um, things that seem more masculine. So fast forward 10 to 20 years, if we look at the scene right now, there are not many female guitarists who accompany. There are not many female um, bowden players. Um, so I'm gonna preface that with, I work a lot with, with male people because there, there simply isn't, isn't female equivalents. And that's really, really sad. But um, what I'm going to talk about is the issues that we really need to address. And I'm going to, I know that we don't have that much time. Um, 
I have, in my experience, I'm 24 years old. My, I'm a board member of FIA. I'm an incoming board member. I'm really, really excited. I'm coming over in May. If you want to grab a coffee and chat, I'd love to meet Mayor Falk. Um, yeah, so my first ever Folk Alliance was in 2020. Um, and I was 22 years old, I was over the moon to be an official showcase artist. I'd, I'd never think that I'd get to do that at that age with my band. I was so excited. I came over, I just had surgery, I was on crutches. There was nothing that was stopping me from trying to gain opportunities and gain um, recognition for my songs and for my band. And um, a comment that was relayed back to me was, wow, with that accent, she could have her pick of American husbands. I was not there to get a husband and of course I only I didn't realize that there was a great formal way to report this I should have emailed I should have found somebody I should have said something but I was frozen at that time and only a few hours later I did what I usually do and I took to Twitter and within a day Angus the amazing director that he is had mailed me um, offering support. Now, for me, I'm pretty thick skinned. I went to conservatory. I grew up in a rural area. So a lot of these comments, I do shake off. But when it comes to um, the industry right now, we're hearing accounts of rape. We're hearing accounts of serious, serious assault, gatekeepers exploiting musicians. Now, I'm going to use this in men to women, male to, to female. This doesn't always happen. It can be gender to any gender to any gender. But most of the time, in my experience, the testimonies that I've heard, it's been male violence against women. Um, a lot of the time there's gatekeepers who are all too willing to exploit young emerging and sometimes not young um, sometimes simply emerging musicians. Um, a few years ago when I was 20 I had just won an award that I wanted all my life and someone asked me to have sex with them in, um, in return for a festival slot. At that time I froze up, I laughed, I crossed the road and I went home. We were all coming out of a venue. Only this year did I realise how predatory that was. So how can we actually change this? How can we make sure that gatekeepers, especially in a situation where, um, where there's you know, a community of practice, which is so close knit. That's what I love about folk music. It's so close knit, but that is also not a good thing because it can really lead the way to exploitation. So it's like a double edged sword. Um, how can we actually make sure that these gatekeepers um, isn't, are not going to exploit um, women. In Scotland, 45% um, of workers, this is not in the music industry, of workers said that they had been, um, had, had been sexually harassed. Um, one in three workers said in the last year that this happened. Um, so of course, this is a, an issue that's pervasive in society. Um, but next month, um, we will be reporting findings to First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. So luckily, we have the ear of top politicians over here. But I'm not sure that over there it's as simple to get heard by, by Biden, if that makes any sense. Um, coming forward, I want to know how um, women and people of all genders can actually have meaningful change, making sure that these predators are not rewarded with a Grammy or with a TV episode or with, with awards and given the gigs. How do we call it out? How do we make sure that victims can call it out? For me, I think that the Musicians Union Code of Conduct, which I'm putting in the chat box now is a great way for bands which are not orchestras that have a HR department to sign up to that code of conduct to say that that is what they will uphold and every member in that band will uphold that behavior um a lot of the time you know we do a gig sometimes I sell CDs and someone gropes my arse at the CD stand but what do I do in that time these are people who are given their disposable income to me. I feel like I'm at the mercy of other people. I feel so exposed. How do we sort that? How do we make sure that you can call it out then and there? Um, a code of conduct is great. For organizations like Folk Alliance, if there's any events, even under 25, Faze Ross in Scotland is an organization that has chaperones for any event for people 25 years old and under. Um, but the thing is, is that people's behavior don't just stop after 25. So I'm not sure if that's the only way forward. Education, we need to hold much more panels on, on education, <laughs> educating everyone on, on correct, just being a good person, then he'd be a dick. 
right, strict protocols and zero tolerance. And I know that that's what full clients is about, having zero, zero tolerance to this. But if somebody isn't willing or, or um, courageous enough to come forward, then and there, when it happens, or whenever it happens, five months after, five years after, then how are we going to protect them? So in order to fix that, we should really start um, thinking about anonymous helplines. I know that we're doing that in Scotland with something called the Bit Collective. It's an anonymous email thing. Scotland's a very small place. I'm aware that America is not, and the US and South America, like I'm aware that I'm in a very tiny place. Um, we should have a campaign within our community of practice to raise awareness about this um, and to support people in coming forward and also make sure that they are going to be believed. Um, and it's not just this pervasive boys culture of, oh, no, he's fine. That's just how he is. That's just them. That's just, oh, he's a bit handsy. That's not good enough. It never was and it never should be. For me, I'd love to, I'm not sure if this already exists. I've only been one time. I would love a physical safe space at events that Folk Alliance and other organizations that I'm involved with uh, runs, I would like a physical safe space where someone can go and immediately get help. I want a phone number that no matter where you're at at the conference or at events that someone can call and say, hey, this happened. These are short term things. The systemic issues with um, violence towards women and misogyny in the music industry is, is not gonna be fixed um, by these things, but we, we can start. I know that I've rambled and it's all been kind of all over the place, but um, yeah, we're, we are doing things in Scotland with our trade unions, um, but I just thought that talking about this here and showing that this behaviour does exist within the, the kuthi, amazing folk music organisations and cultures, like basically it's such a great close-knit community that people don't believe that it happens but behind closed doors, at the party, after the fish, at the hotel, like, People just don't believe that happens. And I think that it's generational as well. So thank you so much for having me. I know that I've rambled. I'm really, really, really sorry. Please do, like I'm on Twitter all the time. If you want to shout out, we can grab a coffee at the conference. We can talk further about this, um, but I'm really, really looking forward um, to seeing what what the what the um, EDI, we see EDI here, um, um, committee, you know does and i look forward to event, um going to more events okay thanks iona thank you so much for such a powerful testimonial and a very important issue that um, has been discussed within folk alliance but within the council we need to discuss it more and find ways to be able to implement some better practices of course and and stronger measures um i I, would is this something that we should uh, spend some time unpacking now, or should we um, go and uh, get all of the testimonials and then spend some time? Uh, just wanted to make see if that was a. Uh, what, what do you think, uh, Karima? Because um, 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 I think probably if we, we once we go through all of these, we will have some time for Q and A and discussion. So maybe let's make sure we can hear all of the um, testimonies first and. If you all do have comments or questions, please just write them down, and and we'll we'll have a moment for that in in a little bit. But and if you and if you'd like to drop them in the chat, either to everyone or privately to me, I'm I'm going to make a running document of any insights and questions that we want to keep track of. So wonderful. Well, thank you again, Iona, and thank you for being strong in all of your experiences. Thank you for sharing with us, and um, thank you for letting us know um, a couple of routes that you have seen in other organizations that we might be able to take into consideration as we're going forward. Thank you again. And um, well, our next one is going to be from, uh, from Bob, Bob Weiser. He's, he sent uh, down a video ahead of time. So we're gonna have that. This is about a five minute video. And so uh, whenever we're ready. Hey Bob. Bob Weiser here, speaking from Cape Cod traditional land of the Wampanoag, the people of the first light. I'm a longtime participant in the folk community, a folk alliance member for most of the past 30 years, and I applaud the progress made around equity issues in recent years. This was not always the case. Folk alliance as an organization and the folk community in general has always included many people who mean well. However, being of good intention doesn't always translate into taking concrete steps around equality, diversity, and equity. 
This hardly makes us unique, but there are some things I think we can examine more closely as we move forward. Most of our attention in this town meeting process will be focused, as it should be, on how we carry on as an institution. How shall we allocate resources? How can we make our advocacy in the arts world and the public arena fall more strongly and effectively in support of equity? How will the Folk Alliance exercise impactful leadership with our individual and organizational members? We've taken great steps these past few years, naming systems of oppression and privilege, land acknowledgement, increased inclusion of folk culture outside the predominant white paradigm, discussions and panels on a wide range of topics, all great stuff. But I want to share some of my thoughts and observations made over the course of 55 years of adult life, seeking to make change in our society around issues of race, class, and gender inequality. The use of the term inequity in place of inequality has actually been a good place to start. But what has been holding us back all this time? What stands in the way of more of us making a bigger commitment to place equity at the center of how we think about our roles, both as an organization and also as individuals living and working in our local communities? Whether we're artists, presenters, media, or fans, there's probably a good chance we agree that more could and should be done. I think, though, that most of us have been too comfortable and possibly too numb to go deeper. My proposal is a simple one. As individuals, we need to also make a lasting commitment to examining and sharing our own stories and listening to the stories of others. The Folk Alliance Initiative's commitment to conversation and continuing the conversation have tiptoed into the handful, I'm sorry, they've tiptoed into this. I think there's a lot more to be accomplished by sharpening the focus and increasing the handful of members who participate. I've participated in this kind of work, sharing and listening, and seen it strengthen people's ability to take on difficult challenges in my past experience as a community and labor organizer. Not to meant to take anything away from the big picture stuff, but rather based on my own experience that swimming in the ocean of white supremacist normalcy has served to make us numb. I say this as a white person who still cries at the memory of seeing on TV children my own age being spit at and cursed on their way to school. Numb is being able to pass through a day without noticing, every day or nearly every day. I can't speak for our BIPOC colleagues, but I have heard it said that there's also a kind of numbness that goes with being aware that you're always one bad traffic stop away from having your life turned upside down from knowing that the most accomplished journalist or TV personality, college professor, athlete, musical performer, or even a federal judge is considered available to use as a target for someone else's political career or just as someone's scapegoat. Speaking for myself, I've stood silent when I should have spoken up, looked the other way when I felt powerless to make a difference. My immigrant grandfather arrived here with nothing, worked hard, enough to have something to lose in the depression and did. But my mom still became a school principal. She'd never have considered herself privileged, yet the door of opportunity was way more open to her than to many others whose families sweated for generations to build this country. As a person who worked in blue collar industrial jobs for a good part of my life, I'm thoroughly aware of the ways in which our society makes so much of the everyday reality in which people live invisible. Whatever other micro initiatives we launch in our upcoming strategic plan, let's make some space, invest some of our capital in the small work, the micro work. Music and other parts, arts, offer us a means to uncover these hidden worlds. In my opinion and experience, the healing process of sharing and listening to one another is a key component of increasing our capacity for working toward equity. These are our songs. Let's sing them and encourage them to be sung and heard. Woody and Pete, Ronnie and Odetta, Holly Near, Barbara Dane, Chris Matthews, Zoe Mulford, Tom Prasado Ra, and a hundred thousand others. They wrote and write these songs. They sang, still sing these songs. It's our job to let them be heard as widely as we can. All right, Bob Weiser, one of our uh, wonderful uh, senior members of, uh, of the Folk Alliance community. Wonderful testimonial. And uh, we have just one more uh, testimonial that was signed ahead of time from one of our, uh, our council members, uh, 
Alexa Dawson, if uh, if you don't mind speaking just a little bit, um, I'd love to open the floor for you. Thank you. I know I've had uh, some time to introduce myself and probably some time to talk about the affinity group, although I was joined by Dom, luckily, so he has plenty to say also about the, the caregivers and parents group. But I just noticed a common theme in a lot of the reflections um, that came out of the affinity groups. And I just wanted to highlight that I think that regardless of our our shared identities and you know our intersections of society, we we all just want to be respected and we want to have resources. And um, we talk a lot about the respect part, but the resources part is just as important. And I just wanted to share a testimonial about how my solo career started. I won't be very long, but um, it started because of a grant that was targeted uh, or provided to um, or offered to indigenous musicians who wanted to incorporate their culture into their music. And up until that point, I had always just really felt that um, for whatever reason, nobody wanted to hear about that. And so for me to be given an opportunity to actually produce an entire album that was a space where I could say exactly who I was um, and and share exactly you know the deep um, kind of emotional and troublesome things uh, and also hopeful things you know that that I was thinking about um, I I don't know that I would have really been able to have the last few couple of years that I've had so it all started with a resource it all started plainly with with cash money you know it started with the money to get it going and i think that um folk alliance i know as i mentioned before um i hadn't gone before because of the cost plainly i hadn't been to the conference just because it was too expensive and um because i was able to go for you know, certain reasons and with with some help and with some touring funds and with some assistance, I was able to get to my first conference and saw what I was missing. And through that first Folk Alliance, so many doors were open to me. Um, this conference is, is a resource in and of itself. And it's a place unlike anywhere I had ever been as far as being introduced to the, the network of people. I was also a part of the Indigenous Music Summit. And through the Indigenous Music Summit, I met so many people that I'm I'm working with now, you know, that I'm doing uh, collaborations with and things like that, um, coming to their festivals, inviting them to my town, you know, things that, that make a difference in a career, stepping stones that are, are real intangible um, advancements. And that's all because of Folk Alliance and because I actually got my foot in the door with a registration and a free place to stay in New Orleans because um, I couldn't have afforded the room. So I just wanted to bring up um, that this year I'm really pushing it to especially Midwestern artists because of, I just double checked with Jennifer, but until the end of April, um, Folk Alliance is offering the registration for $200, and that's lower than than I've ever known it to be. And also, there are still scholarships available, if I'm not mistaken. And so, I just wanted to say that in this space, um, where some of you may know people who haven't been to Folk Alliance because of the cost, maybe are working on a solo career but haven't got their foot in this door. And I just wanted to encourage people to reach out and you know share this with your friends. If they haven't been, if you think that they, um, you know, are artists, presenters, whoever, if they're presenters, have them call me and we'll get in there. But um, just wanted to, to say maybe, maybe this is an opportunity. I know that, um, that the lowered prices you know, due to some struggles because of the past two years. And so maybe we can turn this upside down and, and make it a, a, a happy story and get a bunch of new artists there that 
um, maybe before wouldn't have had the means to get in the door. So that's all I had to say. I thank you so much. Yeah, miigwech. Thank you so much, Alexa. Thank you for sharing. And, and yes, of course, that's something we have to keep in the forefront here because there is a there's a monetary cost to inclusion. That's something we should just always keep in mind. And, I, and, and that's some, a lot of the conversations on the table that, that have been out there. Well, wonderful. Well, let me, uh, that's, uh, I believe that's all the testimonials we have signed up ahead of time. So I'm going to pass it over to Karima here to speak a little bit about our affinity findings and the synthesis of, of what we found with all the different council members coming together. Karima? Yeah, thank you so much. And um, it was really beautiful to hear some of those testimonials and um, where everybody's coming from. In the beginning, I, I kind of rushed through my introduction. I was a little nervous at the top, but um, I realized yeah. some of you are probably like, well, who actually are you? Um, so just to give a little bit more context, um, I currently work at a place called the East West Center. It's at higher education. It's international um, education. I also help students organize festivals. My, my whole background is um, in sort of the arts administration and education. And in Chicago, I worked at the Old Town School of Folk Music for seven years. I'm the daughter of a folk musician, um, feminist, Kristen Lems, who actually founded the National Women's Music Festival. So a lot of what you were mentioning, Iona, really resonated with me. Um, she founded it in 1974 because um, it, it, at Champaign-Urbana, they were told that no women um, were performing because no one was, quote, good enough for the festival. So she created her own and it's still running now. So anyway, I just like to share that about my genealogy and background because um, I think it's important to say where we come from and who's influenced us um, for understanding our place in the world. Um, and I've learned that a lot here too from Hawaii, from Kanaka people. Um, your, your genealogy isn't just the folks that you're directly related to, but it's your teachers and your influences along the way. And that's important to recognize. Um, also, my father is from Algeria, from North Africa, so I identify as North African. Um, that whole side of my family is Muslim, so I want to also identify as a Muslim who's also fasting for Ramadan right now, um, just to add a lot of the other layers into it, because um, I believe that Charlie mentioned in the affinity group he was in that you want to come into a room and feel like it was made for you. Um, in all of your identities, right? So um, we are gonna keep it moving a little bit and actually see if some of our council members would like to share some of the observations they made from the various affinity groups that they attended. Um, we did kind of have some meetings together to talk about it last week and there were a lot of themes and a lot of through lines and also a lot of differences. The way that I sort of, um, noticed things was there were, <clears throat> there were sort of different needs depending on how long a, a particular group has had space to come together, meaning inside the Folk Alliance community. So there seemed to be some groups where there was a really a need for sharing of grief, of catharsis, of sort of venting, of connecting, of hearing each other. And then there were some other groups where there's a bit more of process oriented um, what are some steps we can take? And it seems like that's a balance and a need for both, right? A need to be heard and connect with other people who are having the same experiences that you are, and then a need to actually um, work through all of that and make recommendations for how to address those experiences and make it more comfortable and more, um, more home for everybody. Um, so instead of actually, at first we were thinking about showing you a chart, but it was just too much text to read through it all. So I just want to kind of open the floor to my other um, council members to see if anyone wanted to share a few of their observations. Um, I will go ahead and start. I also um, joined the younger folks group 35 and under, um, which was great and one of the one of the interesting things was sort of the idea of not so much being younger but being newer to the scene and what kinds of needs there are there but then also 
this idea of um, institutions or venues that are sustained by older folks, more maybe more traditional donors and supporters, um, and the fact that younger folks just do not have the kind of resources to be able to be the same kind of donors, funders, sustainers um, that previous generations have had because of the way the economy has gone. And so how do you actually um, find a way to move into these positions of power and influence in organizations without having the same kind of um, resources at hand? And, and just this idea of how do you both preserve and innovate at the same time and um, without sort of alienating your traditional base, um, support base. So that was some of the things that I noticed in my group and just wanna sort of open it up to anyone else who might wanna share just a thought or two um, from the affinity group you attended. Looks like but we for, have Yeah, go, you go ahead and I saw Jacqueline first too, yeah. Hi, well, I was part of, um, the Latina, and I, I didn't explain this uh, at the top, but I'm, I'm a publicist. Um, I work a lot with helping people find their voice. Um, who are they and, and the why, and then communicate that. But with, with me, um, my, my mother's um, from the 1600s, Spanish lived in the same place. And, and it just always um, got to me the whole masculine, feminine of the Spanish language. So I choose to use Latina in, in place of the masculine O and the feminine A to recognize the fluidity of gender that exists beyond this gender binary. And I'm committed to inclusion and recognizing the contributions of everyone. So that that's really important to me. And I think that in the, the affinity group that I was in, we had four or five countries involved. And it was funny because when, when people engage in music in the States, they sing in Spanish. And when they're playing at, in their home country, they sing in English. And just how, how interesting that was. But more than anything, the community, regardless of country of origin, uh, how they got here, um, the love that was in the room, the welcome, the welcomeness that was in the room, the feeling of, I found my people. <laughs> and that means all of us, um, we're all headed in that same direction of inclusion and equity and making the world a better place. And, and, and um, Aona, I just applaud you uh, for your courage because I think with your voice, you're encouraging all of us to find that bravery and, and find our own voices um, and speak that with grace to move to move things forward for generations to come, um, so that that really is that place of connection. Um, and Karima and Dom, just I can't tell you what that meant to the people in our group. Even afterwards, I've got comments saying that was wonderful. Why has no one done this before? So um, just amazing um, work here. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, I saw Charlie's hand up next. Find the right button there. I think we found it. Thank you, Karima. Um, so I represented uh, or represent uh, people with disabilities. Um, and we've we've had a few affinity groups over the past couple of years. Uh, and, and there have been discussions at conferences. Um, so we've been heading in, in a direction where we are starting to feel like we have more representation. I think there was a there was an ex, sort of an excitement and optimism uh, that as we come out of or reemerge uh, into a, a world where we can gather uh, in person again, there is an optimism that uh, conferences, you know, those of us planning conferences, concerts, uh, all the different opportunities that are out there for us, uh, that these things will be planned with a greater emphasis of inclusion for people with disabilities. And uh, one thing that was uh, important, I think, with our affinity group was, was that we are a very diverse, you know, within the disability community, we're extraordinarily diverse. 
the spectrum of people with disabilities, uh, you know, from people with invisible disabilities, with uh, physical disabilities, with mental health issues, with developmental, uh, it's just a, an enormous um, spectrum, a very wide spectrum of people. And, uh, and with any luck, I think Reggie said something earlier about how he's very happy to be a part of the 55 and over group. With any luck, most of us will, uh, eventually be somewhat disabled in some some fashion or form. So the opportunity for us as a community to start designing our uh, conferences, concerts, festivals, uh, education programs, whatever it is we're doing with uh, disabilities in mind and, and ways to include people, you know, that is as simple as a ramp to the stage for the opening act and not just the headline and th you know little things like that but there's an awful lot that we can do and uh, we're very optimistic that in this new world that we're going into maybe we can we can be at the front of really making it a, a, a more inclusive world for all of us and thank you i will mute thanks Charlie. that was uh very, um, one of the more, it, it, what you reported out was so interesting when we were in our group together. Um, and, and that's why sh this share out is, is so important too, because you do hear the perspectives that you may not, you know, there's this importance in having a, a safe and um, a, a space for people who, who do just share that same identity to feel safe and comfortable, but also being able to share that with the larger community so you do get these insights is also just so important. Um, any other council members want to add in um, some of their... Okay, Dom, go ahead. Well, you know, it, it's amazing. One of the through lines I found with all the discussion is, is just be, is being heard. You know, like when uh, I guess as an artist, one of the things that uh, in developing material that I deal with a lot when taking it into the studio, for example, you write the song, you develop it into its final form, then you have to translate it into something that you can take into a professional situation with all these machines. And there's a period where you're scratching your head trying to figure out how is it all going to come together. And I've seen that these affinity groups are allowing for us to have the head scratching uh, uh, experience together, trying to figure out what are we, what are we trying to get at? And because of course it's easy to, I think Bob spoke about it in his testimonial where how do we get it beyond a conversation we may have heard, may or may not have heard before into action. And I think that the affinity groups really brought something uh, together that I think allowed for people to be able to express themselves in ways that I think our uh, community not that they haven't been able to express themselves before, but I think it's given them a new means in which to do it. I second that, Dom, from the from the, the panel that I witnessed. It just felt like there was a lot of relief at, yeah. the, at speaking. And, and, and touching upon something that Karima mentioned, you have sort of two functions that are happening. There's um, people who have gotten together before and then folks who haven't gotten together before. I mean, um, uh, for my affinity group, which was parents and, and caretakers, I think in some ways it's very similar to the, uh, the group on disability where there's such a diversity of what parents and caretakers can be in the folk music community. I mean, it was, it was staggering just to be able to acknowledge that there was such a diversity of people. And I thought that that was for me personally, was very powerful. And I think that as we continue these, uh, having these affinity groups, I, I definitely want to uh, make a notion and to, to keep the affinity groups as a strong part of the conference as well as um, the general community. I think that seemed like a, a home run in terms of the, the function that, uh, that they serve for each, each and every person. Wonderful. I think we might have time for maybe just one more um, share out and, you know, this will all also be shared with the public at large once it's, you know, synthesized into um, what we are hoping to, to to give to the um, to the the board, and then also on the nineteenth, I believe it is, is when our actual council gathers. Yes, Thursday, May nineteenth, at the Century Ballroom. 
um, both live streamed and for in, in, in person and virtual as well at the actual conference itself. There'll be even more to update because we're gonna do um, more than that. We're going to add to this work between now and then is what I'm trying to say as I lose my words. But anywho, um, I see a couple more council members with their names up. up. We have hands up. We Thanks, have Paula. Gerald and then and Paula. Okay, cool. And then after that, we're gonna be going to question and answer. So don't worry, you all get a chance to, to And talk. please drop those questions in the chat too um, so I can put them in our little log if you're willing to share them. Thank you guys. Yes, Gerald, take it away. <laughs> Yeah, one one of the the, the things that that uh, like in our, our conversation focused on uh, in the indigenous group was, you know, having made this space, we have to commit to continue to have the space, and like that 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 commitment's got to be firm, right? The other thing was that the 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 there are many layers and there are many parts of the industry, right? And we have to have attention to all of the different parts uh, of, of the industry as well. As, I mean, artists obviously, but but you know the other parts of the industry have to be in, in, included kind of self-consciously in the in, in the discussion. Um, so I, th those are just two things that I thought were important: being heard, and then making the space, and and committing to make the space. Yeah, it's not just a one-off; it's pretty much for life. <laughs> so, um, Paula. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention a couple things um, arising out of the activism and change makers affinity group. I, I mentioned in my opening remarks it was uh, hugely well attended, and it and it was. I, I I wanted to because I think it's important for FAI to to know or to to recognize the people on the call. Yes, they were they were diverse in every way uh, that others have described, um, but it was split pretty much 50 50 between creators uh, and those who touch uh, folk music in other ways um, as as agents, as managers, as um, uh, uh, tour uh, promoters and, and whatnot. And so that I don't know how that maps to the membership of FAI overall, but within this space, um, that was the case. And um, I, I think I alluded to it in uh, my my earlier remarks, but there is huge diversity uh, within the people who care about this issue in, within FAI on even what activism means uh what does it what does it mean to be a change maker and on the call uh, there were some people whose active activism has centered in their art it has it has centered in music um, or how they touch music for other people on the call their activism may have nothing to do with music at all uh, but they are as passionate uh, and committed uh, to uh, those forms of activism, environmentalism, feminism, whatever. Uh, and I think one of the things as an observer I took away uh, from that call was there's the, the genre of folk music is deeply tied to this topic. And so, you know, as we continue on this journey of what is the optimal role of activism for FAI, you know, I think, you know, I think that is going to be a road which will require a lot of um, empathy and, um, and uh, heightened listening skills. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if we have, uh, I saw Lily Lewis was able to join and had your hand up for a moment, but then it disappeared. I just wanna make sure I'm not skipping over. Um, 
perhaps. It was oh. an accident. I'm so sorry, folks. I am driving. It was an accident. No worries. We're glad you're here. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Is there other council members? Hi. <laughs> are you able to just say yeah, like a couple to... words about who you are, or is that too much to do right now? Drive no, safe. I can. I can. All right, I, I think I can anyways. Uh, I'm Lily Lewis. I'm based in Louisiana. Once uh, in New Orleans, now I'm in rural North Shore, North Shore Louisiana. Um, I uh, come to this space, I, call, I refer to myself as an intersectional American um, in that I come to this space like from any, any number of angles that, that make work very pertinent to my experience as a member of this community. Um, I've been a uh, part of the committing to conversation movement uh, from the beginning and now it's moved on into continuing the conversation. I'm actually really proud of that work. And is there any, and I, and my contribution to this particular town hall would have been for the, um, for uh, the LGBTQIA plus um, affinity group, um, but I'm assuming that that's already been spoken to. So um, if, if there are any other things I should speak to, please let me know. Thank you so much, Lily, um, for joining us. I think um, we've gotten you know, pretty well-rounded, um, just a little sampler platter of some of the reflections <laughs> from uh, from the affinity groups. And as I mentioned, you'll be able to learn more about that later. Um, I don't know if we want to go to Carolyn, if there are any Q&A um, we'd want to open up to. So I think that we, we've had a very, we've had such a like a rich conversation and obviously like, you know, a meeting like this just reveals how much more there is to say to one another. But I think given honoring everyone's um, time constraints, I know we'd love to hear from our, uh, I think that what the, the, the best thing to do would be for people to drop any lingering questions into the chat so that we can keep a record of them and then, um, and then revisit them when we have time to honor, honor the questions with a more fruitful conversation. Um, and, and then at this moment, what I'd love to do is, uh, transition to wrapping things up. And first, I'd like to just share a little bit um, of a thought of mine, which is to say thank you all for coming together this evening. Um, we've been thinking about this for a long time, and we're so excited about this gathering and grateful to you all for being here. You know, this is a group gathered in a spirit of witnessing and a spirit of action. Um, we want to hear you and we want to serve you. Um, the Cultural Equity Council does. We want to receive your insight and help to make changes and connections informed by what you share. Um, so we thank you for taking the time to putting your mind and spirits toward this work. Um, and then to wrap things up, uh, we'd like to invite the president of the uh, board of Folk Alliance International to share a final word on behalf of the organization and a standing member of the council. Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you, my friend. Um, Hi everyone, uh, my name is Amy Wrightnauer Jacobs. For those of you who I have not met, um, I'm speaking to you today from the indigenous land of the Keech, Tongva and Chumash people, which is currently known as Los Angeles, California. Um, I am a white cisgendered female identifying music industry professional. I am a woman who has had to balance professional demands with prioritizing and fighting for personal health care over the years as someone who's dealt with a chronic illness since I was nine years old, albeit one that might not be overtly visible to most of those around me. Um, I'm here not only as a member with chronic illness, not only as a woman, but as an ally, an advocate, and specifically as a council member, um, uh, as the president of the board of directors. Um, as Bob mentioned earlier in his video, being of good intention does not always equate to action. Being here and seeing everyone present at this town hall and already hearing from so many incredible voices makes me really proud that we, Dom, Karima, the FAI staff, every single one of the council members and participating board directors have approached the creation of this initiative 
deliberately and consciously and giving it the time and patience that it deserves. For while the work ahead of us is incredibly urgent, there is also so much to unpack and make sure that we do this in a way that truly commits to being ongoing. I am so amazed by this incredible group of people who have given their time and energy and vulnerability to move forward and commit to enacting real change for our community. I'm hopeful and excited to each and every one of you for being here today. I want to commit to knowing when I need to listen and when I need to contribute. But at the end of the day, I want you all to know that I'm here to observe and support in any way that I can. And I truly mean that, like if anyone needs to reach out or can just walk up to me personally at the conference, I'm so excited to see so many of you in person and finally hug you. Um, but uh, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone for their time and energy here today and look forward to working and getting to know all of you. Um, so Dom and Karima, I'm gonna hand it back to you, but thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, thank you, everybody. It's been amazing. Uh, Karima and I have just uh, have been enjoying being the co-conveners here, helping out to uh, bring together this council. I think there are a lot of wonderful things along the way. And as long as we keep our hearts open and we keep our hearts open to the community, we can find that balance. It's not impossible. It's not gonna be done in one day as we've all mentioned in one form or another, but there are gonna be demands and, and there are going to be needs that our community is, will need fulfilled in some form or another. Some that we understand, some we may not understand, but I'm so glad that this council and this group of people are, are here now and that we've had so much positive response from the general FAI community. I thank you all so much. Yeah, so um, we do still have, um, if, if you, we still have the invitation open to submit your thoughts and reflections to the council on the community sharing form, um, which maybe somebody can drop in the chat if you haven't done so yet. We would love to continue to hear from you. Um, some reminders of our next steps. We'll be meeting, the council ourselves will be meeting at the end of April to sort of synthesize our findings and, um, and share it with the Folk Alliance International Board and help guide them as they craft the upcoming strategic plan. Um, but I don't wanna, I don't, I wanna make sure that that's not looked at as sort of the end point. That's really just the beginning. It's just the threshold to more work. So it's not like, oh, we got it in the strategic plan. So the end, no, it's really just kind of codifying it so that it's part of what we look to our document that we look to, 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 to write the ship anytime when we feel like we're going um, astray and making that part of the official, you know, um, priorities and, and, and forward thinking of the institution moving forward. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, we'll be sharing out in the 2022 conference in Kansas City at, um, as part of the community gathering. And the gathering is scheduled for Thursday, May 19th at 2 p.m. Central Time in the Century Ballroom and will also be live streamed to virtual attendees. So we'll be looking forward to seeing you there, either in person or on a screen. And um, I guess that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much. You please, please continue to use the community submission form. Let, if we can get that popped up one more time before we, we, uh, we call it to an end. Everybody's so happy about the meeting. Uh, we want to make sure that that link doesn't get, uh, get lost in the shuffle there. Yeah, this is the this is the moment, you know, and, and the folk music community, we tend to say, oh, nobody wants to hear me, but this is where we you actually get heard and we bring and we bring it in. So please tell others to submit their uh, their thoughts and their observations as well so that we can consider all of those things. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, shall we be uh, sweeped away on the wings of. Uh, well, I guess we had the graphic already, so we were we've um, we almost got swooped away on the wings of the graphic. But um, 
Someone help me out, Tressa. Where are you? <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Goodbye. It's so good to see you. I'll see you at the conference. So long.